Thank you for being here. We are excited to have you. Um, uh, Christopher Kato, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, Emma, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Sanyu, who is a frequent uh, one of our, uh, the, the people who joins most of our sessions. Emmanuel, we are very excited to have you, our in-house insurer. Mm. <clears throat> Yes, James, uh, very welcome. A uh, number of people are joining in. We should be starting within the next few minutes. We usually give ourselves a couple of minutes to just kind of get to know what you're doing. Uh, Emmanuel uh, Safari is an insurer with Britam and UAP Old Mutual Insurance. Uh, Emmanuel has shared with us quite a bit on the subject of insurance within our sessions. Emma, we are very excited to have you if you need any insurance needs please don't hesitate to uh, get in touch with emma uh then we have the um the royal yes david's restaurant is called royal snacks uh, uh it is on dr lucille uh, Coty road uh right opposite yes along the slope uh, that heads to tasogulu i think that road has just been uh the beautiful roads in gulu have just been uh, uh, they, they, it's an amazing place now. And uh, so if you are in Gulu, please don't hesitate to go to Royal Snacks and uh, and support David's business. Uh, we want to support one another as we grow. We believe that that's where the, the real secret of success is seated. Uh, yes, uh, we, we are just at that point when we begin. Today we have uh, the honor of um, uh, having uh, Alex Matovu, uh, Alex is um, the managing partner at Signum Advocates, uh, an amazing uh, business and a leader in uh, in uh, in commercial and intellectual property law. Uh, we are we are very excited to have you, Alex. It's such an honor to have you here. Um, and and I believe that when we think about this topic, many of us uh, feel our hands are tied. It is one of the things whenever you read about a patent it uh, seems as though it's not, not something which can happen here in uganda and even though it happened it seems as though it's not something which will be protected here in uganda yet you will read about entrepreneurs in other parts of the world where they say my assets is i have three patents and that's the asset which i'm holding and and, and for me that's something which we need to change and uh, alex uh, is uh, is one of the leaders in this sector he has spent uh, he has spent uh, the better part of the last uh, close to ten years uh, really uh, understanding understanding this uh, this uh, this sector, but also working very hard to make sure that he's making it possible for the people who actually want to venture there. And Alex has been kind enough to come and share his knowledge with us today. And as he shares his knowledge, really, what he's trying to tell us is that. Uh, possibly there is much more we can do. There is a lot we can be able to do together. There is a lot which we can be able, there is a lot which possibly is already happening within the country that honestly we may just not know. And that is the reason why we have uh, we have asked Alex to join us today and I'll introduce him fully in just a moment. Uh, yeah, I want to say a big thank you to all the people who have joined us. Uh, I've seen a few more people sharing their businesses um oh james uh, babumba is uh, into drying fruit drying and uh, honey processing james please do uh, share uh, your contact also I, I know a couple of people have been looking for someone who is into fruit drying so i'm um, i'm particularly happy that you're here please do share your contact um Herbert, uh, kakiza is uh, with multi consults limited an electrical and mechanical engineering consultancy company uh, on Clement Hill Road. Uh, we have Osea, who is from Tungamo District, joining us from Tungamo. We are very excited to have you. Salim Majidu uh, from Salim Halal uh, produce suppliers, supply halal meat and chicken and, uh, and, and fish. Uh, Salam, Salim, Salim, thanks a lot for, for, for joining us. We are very excited to have you here. And in case you need any uh, halal products, and uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Salim. Christopher is a business development manager with the 
Nganisha Health uh, Systems, uh, uh, who are into e-health solutions development. And we have Lilian Katiso, uh, who is from Zadok uh, Associates, who are of a financial consultancy and CFO on call, uh, C, uh, the CFO uh, financial advisory services. Great. So at this moment, allow me to uh, really bring in um, our key speaker today, our keynote speaker today, uh, Alex. Uh, Alex is uh, a practicing commercial uh, lawyer, an intellectual property expert uh, who has uh, had uh, whose services and whose work has been acknowledged at the international level. And um, he was ranked by the World Trademark Review as one of Uganda's leading trademark uh, professionals. So we are very excited to have you, Alex as a leader in this sector. He's the managing partner of Signum Advocates, uh, a Uganda law firm that he co-founded in 2014. Uh, the, the firm has received a number of accolades, including the Legacy Award from the uh, UCU Law Society, uh, especially for uh, working with excellence and integrity. Um, uh, that's a farm, and uh, the farm has also been recognized by the Africa League Awards uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa, as the highly com uh, as a highly commended law firm. Uh, Alex is passionate about human development. Uh, he has spoken at uh, various conferences. He's passionate about young people and leadership, uh, and he's uh, one of the uh, the, 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 the people who is trying to enable young lawyers to be able to grow in their careers and to be able to excel at their work. He is currently the chairperson of the Training and Development Committee of the Uganda Law Society, and he's currently spearheading the Young Lawyers Mentorship Series. Uh, Alex, it's such an honor to have you here. Uh, we will just request that you turn on your mic and your video and possibly share your screen so that you can take us through this session of intellectual property, how to protect our business ideas and our brands. Alex, over to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Ronald. It's a pleasure to be sharing with uh, the members present. And I believe and hope that through this session, will have to will learn i uh, will learn what uh, you know i believe god has intention for us to learn this morning i am a firm believer in continuous development i currently head the continuous legal education committee of the uganda law society and through that i have managed to found a number of programs that i hope will be will exist even beyond myself but that's just to speak um, concerning my willingness and desire for continuous learning. I subscribe to the view that the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who did not go to school. It would be those, or it is those who are not willing to learn, and learn and relearn many things about what they do. Someone else said, and I believe, that the greatest of all things that a professional should do is self-development, continuous education is the key to standing out in any profession. So I believe that, you know, us making the time to make sure that we make the most out of these engagements. I'll try to share my screen so that we can all benefit. Uh, Ronald, you help me confirm if it can be seen. Uh, yes, so that we can see it clearly. Yeah, okay. So then I'll turn off my video for purposes of uh, benefiting from making the most of this internet that is now a scarce resource as well. Yes, but anyway, the program, yeah, the program uh, or the topic this morning is intellectual property, protecting brands and innovations. From the flyer, you notice the word business ideas that you will not see here. And the reason is that intellectual property does not protect, uh, does not protect ideas it actually protects that which has been expressed, as I'll explain later. So it is brands and innovations uh, in Uganda. The content of what we shall share is as outlined right there. We'll try to understand, uh, delve into what intellectual property actually means. And there, one of the key things that I hope we can take home is to distinguish what these terms are. 
when we are referring to intellectual property, many of us talk of copyrights, uh, patents, uh, trademarks to mean the same thing. But I hope that by the time we are done with this session, we will have learned uh, what the difference is and use those terms appropriately. There's an image, uh, Ronald, that I shared with you that I thought I would, I would have to share, but um, maybe I forgot it for this particular presentation. But it came up somewhere and I shared it with you, someone who invented something, some Ugandan, and was referring to it as copyright patents in the same sentence. I hope that's the distinction we shall get. But also it's important to know how our intellectual properties can be protected. It's one thing to invent and come up with those these ideas and express them, but it's another to have protection. So how do you get protection? for the attendant or, or respective uh, intellectual property that you own. We'll also look at how to profit. I think that um, if we invent some of these things and you see the quote that I start with, but are not able to turn them into financial or monetary terms for us to develop and grow, then there's no reason for the existence of intellectual property. So it's important to know how to profit, how to benefit from your inventions. Lastly, we'll look at regional and international protection. I know a question has come up to me for all the years that I've practiced. Can I have my brand, whatever innovation I've come up with protected internationally? Or at, at the very least, you know, at a continental level or, or you know, East Africa, whatever region it is. And so we'll also try to tackle that and then uh, we'll get into our Q&A. Um, I'll start by talking about Signum, the firm that I co-founded in the year 2014. Signum is a business uh, law firm. We believe that we are modern and progressive. What that means is that we are attendant to the ever-changing world in which we live. I think the legal profession has largely been understood to be about, you know, um, you know, to be quite stringent and conservative in how we approach things. But we try to be innovative and adaptive to change. That's why we believe that we are modern and progressive. We look for practice areas. We look for industries that have the highest levels of innovation. And we try to equip ourselves as professionals to make sure that we are relevant. Intellectual property, for example, back then was simply about you know, a trademark, a song, or, or whatever, literary works, books that we come up with. But today we talk of many things, including domain names. We talk about innovations in technology. We talk about source codes and different things that we talk about or that are happening. So we try to equip ourselves and get to learn and improve as lawyers so that we are relevant. Uh, we are five partners of over 35 years of combined experience. Uh, you know, some of us have worked for 12 years, others eight years, but when you combine our experience, the service we offer will be giving you 35 years of combined experience. We believe in specialization. So we, we are not generalists. Each of us specializes in one to three areas that we believe you know, are your core areas. So for me, it is intellectual property, it is banking and finance, and it is uh, real estate. So the other aspects are handled by other partners, but when you approach us as a firm, you're able to get a one-stop service as long as it is related to business. We've won a few awards here and there, and we are grateful to God for that, but for us, that's just an inspiration to do more. It's not something we sit back and say, now that we've won the awards, let us relax. We are only eight years as a firm, uh, but we've made serious strides both locally, continentally, and, and, and globally. And so we believe it's just confirmation that you know we should never despise ourselves because of how old or young we are, but to try to focus on improving every time and being on top of our game. Um, we nurture growth and offer peace of mind as our purpose. And what that really means is that when you come to us from a business perspective, we believe that you want to grow. But from an individual perspective, there's a peace of mind that you do not have. If it's a debt that you want to collect, you know, someone who has a paid you, or it's whatever problem you're having, it normally affects your peace of mind. <clears throat> so our goal and what we tell ourselves and our team is that we are here to offer peace of mind. We want to make sure that we don't just give you legal advice, but try to go the extra mile to see that by the time we have concluded on an assignment, you are better than you came. So that's the underlying reason uh, why we do what we do. We stand for three core values, relationship, innovation, and trust. Again, you see innovation at the center, but relationship is really about the longevity and you know how we relate with clients over time. We believe in uh, client retention. It's not just getting us one brief or one instruction. 
we handle it and we say goodbye. We want a relationship. We pride in the fact that we've serviced people for eight years and they've stayed with us. And we hope we can do that for the next 50 or 100 years. Trust is core to what we do. Lawyers, are, our, what we sell as lawyers is actually trust. When someone says, this is my lawyer or my doctor, I don't think they're just talking about buying an item from the market or getting a service and walking away. They believe there's a, a relationship, the bedrock of which is trust that, that they share with their respective uh, professional advisor. Now, going into the topic, if you'll allow me to start with a quote by a gentleman called Mark Getty, and please don't forget this. I'll share this, this presentation, so no worries about you being able to follow. Um, intellectual property, this is what Mark Getty says, intellectual property is the oil of the 21st century. Intellectual property is the oil of the 21st century. Look at the richest men, and of the, I believe, of course, the women, 100 years ago, they all made their money extracting natural resources or moving them around the world. If you've watched the documentary, uh, The Men Who Built America, it's purely about, you know, oil, John D. Rockefeller and others. So for them, it was about extraction of natural resources and moving it around. But today, according to Mark Getty, the richest men have made their money out of intellectual property. Talk about Mark Zuckerberg, talk about Jeff Bezos, talk about Elon Musk. You realize that today it's about the exploitation of the mind, what the mind can do. And for those that have learned what it is and have learned how to turn it into profit, they have become the richest. The one common thing you realize about them is they don't have to be so old to do it. So the question is, what ideas, what things are you thinking and creating and taking for granted that others are ripping huge amounts of money out of? Or could it be that you want to follow the old model that says until we have oil, we will not be able to, you know, we'll never get rich or until we are 60 or 70. There's, there are certain things we've believed about wealth creation that intellectual property seems to, you know, uh, challenge and say, if we are able to discover, if we're able to dig deep into our creativity and learn how to turn that into profit, which is partly the goal of today's presentation, then you may find that our stories will be different. And when our individual stories are different, it's not just even about us, it's about our societies, it's about our nations, okay? So what is intellectual property? As, as we say, whatever we are saying, intellectual property really, as I've mentioned, is about the creations of the mind. It's intellectual, as you hear, it's about intellect, yeah? But then that intellect becomes property. Property is something that can be defined. Property should be something that is tangible. But also we know that property should have something that certifies that someone is the owner of a particular thing. So if I woke up today and said, I have an idea which will solve, for example, HIV AIDS or malaria or whatever it is, but it remains in my mind, chances are high, there'll be nothing to certify that it is my own thing. Why? Because many people are thinking that way. So it's like fish in the lake and claiming that we have this amount of fish until you fish it out and say, this person is the owner of this fish, that fish cannot, cannot bring economic value. So intellectual property is about creations of the mind, but to the extent that they can be protected and attributed to the creators, right? And the forms that that can take is literary, artistic, scientific works, inventions in all fields of human endeavor, scientific discoveries, marks or, you know, that distinguish or signs that distinguish one product from another. If people go on to have them protected, then they qualify as intellectual property in, in, in the legal sense, yeah? So it is okay to say I have IP or intellectual property because I created this, but what we are saying is that it's important that we go the extra mile to do the necessary registrations or recognitions that give us ownership and then gives us the benefits that we are going to see. Now, what are those benefits that we expect that you should be able to have as one who owns IP? We have economic rights and what we call uh, moral rights, but we'll st start with economic reasons because I'm sure everyone is wondering, how do I turn it to profit, you know? What benefits? One is exclusivity. That the moment you are recognized as an IP owner, IP is to mean intellectual property, then you are allowed to exploit or to utilize or to trade in a particular on that particular intellectual property as the exclusive owner. Exclusive means to the exclusion of all others. So anything that someone does without your authorization as an IP owner 
would qualify as an infringement, as we shall see later. The other is, of course, to gain or have benefit from the works that you've created. The other is to encourage innovation. You realize that, you know, in Africa, we are very creative. But like Ronald said in the opening remarks, could it be that the reason why our creativity is not, you know, we do not see it propelled to the levels of what we see in the most civilized world is because of our level of protection. It's because people are not as encouraged. People don't, are not very sure. I mean, even if I did this, what would it give me? So they continue living a certain life or pursuing certain professions or vocations simply not because they're not creative, but they're not sure that they'll be protected. So intellectual property is intended to encourage innovation. There's also a question of effective exploitation of works. As you will notice, most of these IPs have time limitations in terms of protection to allow others to also build on what, you know, others might have founded initially. That if there's so much restriction without certain regulations and limits of protection in terms of time, then by all means would be limiting uh, the level of exploitation of the works, as we shall see, derivative works and others, as I'll explain. Ultimately, like I said, this should not only benefit individuals, it should also go to growing our economies. And of course, growing economies, as you can imagine, for Africa is, is more needed you know, than any other place because we still rank you know, quite behind when it comes to levels of development. And I personally believe that the understanding of intellectual property, its protection and uh, you know, prof the ability to make profit out of it should be a key driver to our economic growth, yeah? So um, moral rights or moral reasons for protection. I mentioned the economic and moral reasons. The first moral reason obviously is the rule or the commandment that we should never steal. Now, when we say steal back then in Bible days, using Bible as an example, it would have been um, a question of stealing your neighbor's donkey or whatever it was. Here, we are saying that your creations are as important or as valuable as your land title was your land. So if you believe that land should not be stolen, why should your IP or another person's IP be stolen? But also we want to have acknowledgement, to acknowledge creators, to acknowledge content creators, what we call creatives, that when people take their time to think through things, I am one of those, I spend sleepless nights thinking of ideas. How do I transform the legal profession? And I come up with a program called Law Firm Management Program. How do I influence and help young people to, to learn and be mentored? I come up with a Young Lawyers Mentorship Series. These are creations of my mind, yeah? Now, there has to be a way for these things to be protected. When we think of Signum as a law firm, I go to bed and I'm thinking and praying and asking God, show me something. And the word standard comes up. And I get to find out that standard in Latin means Signum. And guess what? Eight years down the road, it's one of the leading brands in the profession, yeah? It's creations of the mind. So it is important to offer or to give due respect. Even if you didn't give me money, acknowledge that I did. And that's not for pride. It's simply to encourage more creativity if the creators know that they'll be respected. Of course, you know, right to, you know, uh, it's the right thing to do also. Also, it's about living harmoniously. Imagine if we had debates as to who created what. And you've seen these debates happening. Our most recent being the COVID, the COVID X, as we all know it. And you have battles, you have people going to court, you have all this happening simply because there's someone who deserves to be appreciated and acknowledged. There are some people who will take cases to court and all they need is an ap apology. It's not even about, it's not about being paid. They are saying, just apologize that you claim this was yours, acknowledge me as the owner and I'll be happy. Yeah, so that's what intellectual property exists for, that beyond the money, there are also moral reasons and we are moral people. Certain rules that we all agree, certain basics and norms, that's what the morality is about. That if someone owns something, it's only fair that you have their permission before using it or taking it. That's what intellectual property exists for. Now, I say there are several, like I mentioned, there are several intellectual properties and one of them is what we call patents. Patents are grants of uh, exclusive rights to inventions that are new, useful, and non-obvious. Now, this is extremely important. They are new, they are useful, they are non-obvious. When you compare this to, for example, copyright, as I'll explain later when we get to copyrights, the key word here is that the creation has to be novel. For copyright, you'll hear the word original. When you think about them in the, you know, 
just thinking literally, you would imagine that they are the same. But when we are using them in this sense, we use one to distinguish. I will use the words to distinguish one from another. For patents, it has to be something that we've not seen before. It has to be something that has not existed in the world. For copyright, on the other hand, it can be something that has been seen, but you've put in some labor to create a different form of it that has not been seen, as we shall see. Uh, patent protection in Uganda is only 20 years. And uh, the idea is that it solves a problem, as I'm going to explain. When you look at items not regarded as inventions, you'd be able to see what I'm talking about, but I'll just highlight a few. Of course, you see discoveries, scientific theories, and mathematical methods. The idea here is that while this may not have been seen before, you know, the Albert Einsteins and all these guys that, you know, were serious, uh, you, you know, guys in physics and mathematics and all that, if we had given protection, then I think the concern or the rationale of saying this should not be protected is to allow educational, for educational purposes. So if I have a formula in mathematics that no one can use without my permission, then chances are high we would have problems. We would not have the world moving forward. These are so vital to our living and to growth that you know, they are kept as open even if they would otherwise have been patented. Schemes, rules, and methods for doing business. Again, like I mentioned, that is also for purposes of society's benefit. But I'll focus more on pharmaceutical products because this is a very interesting one. The image I sent you, uh, Ronald, and I, I hope when I'm done with the presentation, you can you can you know share share it on the screen for people to see that statement. I would want to end with it to see if we've understood this whole subject. But there's a debate internationally around protection of pharmaceutical products. And the debate is, if we protect, you could argue that it helps to motivate the guys that we do inventions in pharmaceutical products. On the other hand, the argument is that if there's a pro strict protection, patent protection where these pharmaceutical products or inventions would fall, it would inhibit solving or healing diseases. So if, for example, COVIDx was patented, ideally it would mean that certain countries from where these inventions originate would have monopoly over solutions that should otherwise benefit the whole world. Of course, it's a continuing debate in the sense that if Africa has people's things and is lagging behind and could have utilized those to actually you know, grow like all other continents have, why shouldn't we have the protection? But because we've, you know, we've signed up to certain protocols and international treaties, we cannot have some of these things protected because we are bound. Yeah, so that's that's a continuing debate. I'm sure we will we'll continue with it. But let me just focus now on the criteria, which I mentioned earlier that I would expound on. Number one, what is patentable needs to be new. Being new means it is not anticipated by prior art. Basically, we've not seen any other creation that anticipated that it would appear or from which it can be drawn, whatever you're saying you want to patent, yeah? Or a person who is highly skilled in the relevant area could not easily derive the invention from a combination of prior existing creations. Yes? So that's the meaning of novelty. When we say new in patent, we mean novelty. When we say new in uh, copyright, we mean original. And I'll explain original when I, came, uh, when I come to the copyright part. The other is that there has to be an inventive step. Someone has to illustrate that they, they labored or they put in effort to create this. And all these things are checked when you make your patent registration application. The question will be, is it new? Is it like it's not anticipated by prior art? Two, would it be obvious? Or there's actually an inventive step in creating whatever you're claiming uh, is patentable. The last one is industrial application. Industrial application is just solve a problem. The idea of intellectual property in general is not just, it is to say these ideas are useful its industrial application, the ability to identify an industry and say, there's a problem here and this is what solution I've created and this is how relevant it's going to that particular problem. The process of patentability in Uganda is as stated there, I will not go so much into it in the interest of time, but the idea is to say you have to apply, you have your application has to illustrate that the three components that I talked about of novelty, of having an inventive step 
and of it being industrially applicable ability to solve a specific problem are properly brought out. That is why in the application, you have to be clear what you want to name the patent as or the item that you want to patent. And then the abstract, one illustration of what your patent is, describe it, talk about that, you know, if you can draw all this stuff. There are payments to be made as I'll illustrate later, but basically the idea is to allow the bureau or whoever is examining the registry to be able to examine substantially if your application suits. Now, if they find that it does, they will notify. They will, they will notify and tell you that indeed this thing, you know, can be patented and then you will have a certificate after you've made the necessary payments. Please note that this is not a process that takes a very short time. For some, it can take years because of the nature or the difficulties that are related to substantiation. For example, in Uganda, we used to send, we used to have all applications for patents sent to Harare, which is the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization head offices for examination. Because remember, this is a question of the world, literally, saying this has never happened before. So it's not something you can just sit in Uganda. It may not have happened in Uganda, but it has happened elsewhere. So it's important that they carefully examine. And that's why we shall look at other ways of protection other than patents, which might be faster. Those are the fees. I'll not go so much into them, but you need to note that it can be a foreign or domestic patent and the fees are different. Now, let me come to utility models, which are um, the alternative to patents. They would have, basically you would have had patent protection, but because of the difficulties, like I've mentioned, the depth, the hardship of successfully getting a patent, some people opt for this other option, which I'm going to explain uh, and what it means. So utility models also known as petty patents as an Alex, are you still there? Sorry, we seem to have just lost Alex for uh, a few minutes. Uh, let's just try to get him back. Uh, if you have any questions, please do prepare and share. Uh, the, the, the questions in the chat room. Uh, we'll just try to get Alex back on. I think his line dropped uh, just at that point when we're try trying to understand petty, petty, petty patents. So he will be coming back shortly. Let's, uh, I'm just getting the team to help him get, get back. But in, in case you have any questions, any inquiries, uh, please do uh, share those inquiries in the chat room. Uh, so that we can be able to capture those questions and he will be able to address them uh, immediately after his session. Uh, his network dropped a bit, but he should be back shortly. If you have any questions, uh, you please don't hesitate to share them uh, as we try to get Alex back. Uh, George, you'll help me see if he's back so that you make him host again. Uh, uh, but a big thank you to all of you who have joined us. Uh, as usual, we request that you say hi in the chat room. You tell us your name and the business which you do for networking purposes uh, so that we can be able to grow together. We can be able to do business uh, together. Uh, and, and and kind of uh, kind of move. Um, we're trying to get Alex back so that we can continue with this insightful conversation. I was right there taking notes about the utility models. I guess all of us want to hear about what they exactly are. 
So he will be back shortly. Just give us a moment. We apologize for that. Uh, this is the quote which Alex spoke about. I'll leave it up so that you can read it as we wait for him to get back onto the call. Yes, Alex. No worries. Okay, sir, sir. Great. Uh, I've just managed to get to Alex. He should be joining us uh, shortly. He had uh, an interruption with his network. Please do send the questions through. Uh, we have Henry who is saying, can we patent a business idea specifically, ideas specifying jurisdiction in Uganda, for example, ideas done in a foreign country, but are not yet done in Uganda, so that you can be able to. Yeah, I think uh, when Alex gets back, Henry, uh, he shall address that question. Uh, we want to welcome Sylvia from uh, Ivanda, who is into interior and landscape design and welding and metal fabrication. She has shared her contact. If you're in her area code, please don't hesitate to uh, give her some business. Uh, yes, Ruth, uh, Ruth Natavi uh, from Engo Tours and Adventures. Ruth, very uh, welcome here. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, Opuru, uh, Senior Marketing Officer with the Ministry of Trade, uh, Industry and Cooperatives. Uh, Chris, we are very we are very welcome. Thank you for being here. I think one of these days we need to invite the Ministry to have a conversation on a bit of the areas uh, that, that, they, that, that, that they lead on, especially in understanding cooperatives and how some government programs can benefit entrepreneurs. Chris, we are happy to have you. Michael, uh, uh, and uh, Michael has a question, are intellectual property rights guaranteed in Uganda, especially when it comes to natural elements, such as fabricating uh, fabricating of some real metals in Uganda? Yeah, I think that will be addressed. Uh, there's another question from Kaduya, uh, Kaduyu Abdul Abdallah. Uh, I, I think that question will be, will be answered, yeah. Most welcome, most welcome. Thanks. Let me just see if we have managed to get uh, uh, get uh, Alex back. Alex is back. Uh, George, please help me make him host again so that we can be able to proceed with our conversation. George, please make him host. Let's just try to get uh, Alex back on uh, in a moment and then we proceed. Sorry about that.
Okay, uh, my most sincere apologies. Like I said, um, I think internet now is the most valuable asset currently. I don't know if it's only in Uganda, but uh, yeah, it's such a valuable asset. We, we cannot underestimate it that we did pre-COVID days. Uh, I am using my phone internet because I'm not in office. So it gets disrupted every now and then. My apologies. Um, yeah, but if we can just carry on from where we stopped, I see Ronald has shared the, the, the excerpt from the new vision that I've, I've always you know, wanted us to have. I will only disclose my diabetes and cancer formula after patenting it. I would like Ronald that by the, at the end of the session, we try to see if the participants can see what is wrong with this gentleman's uh, statement. I am ready to declare my formula to the National Drug Authority. However, this will happen after my product is patented to ensure that it's protected from protected from what let can just finish for us that sentence abel kamoga she can unmute patented from oh okay they can't unmute but it says patented from copyright piracy patented from copyright piracy Ronald, kindly share your screen again at the end. For now, uh, let me try to share mine so we can proceed. But we'll come back to that particular um, gentleman's statement. Where I stopped, I was talking about utility models, and I was saying, is any technical solution related to the modification of existing devices, configuration or disposition of elements of some appliance? Now, these are examples. Appliance, instrument. I know recently, I think last year, there was a utility model registered for the Adungu by a gentleman whose name I forget, but I think some of us know him. He heads a band called Janzi Band. Um, yeah, so it's an appliance, it's an instrument, it's a handicraft mechanizations and products, including you know, those of, a gen of genetic resources, herbal, as well as nutritional formulations, which have practical use and give new effects. So for example, for medication or anything to do with medicines, where patent law would not be protective, uh, some people may, may resort to utility models. In summary, utility models are about protecting inventions in the same manner as patents, although they're more suited for minor innovations. Remember, the word was invention and novelty for patents. So where you think something is not necessarily novel, but you have done some sort of minor innovation or improvement to something existing, then chances are high you could qualify for a utility model. And you, you want to be offered ex, uh, exclusivity for a limited period. This period is only 10 years. Remember patents were 20 years. Here we are talking 10 years. Look at those examples. I think that looks like a padlock, but it's a unique one. Someone has, a, has gotten a padlock, which is already existing, but now has put codes, you know, like you're opening a safe and say that addition should qualify me for a PT model and they are qualified. Look at this. I think we refer to it as a percolator. Ideally, the percolator is, you know, is something that has already exist, been existing, uh, but someone creates something, maybe about the button that helps it to open, or about you know, the ability to show you how much uh, liquid is, is included or put in there, something like that. But you've just made a small or minor innovation or addition to something existing. We also have in intellectual property something called industrial designs. Industrial designs are about the protection of ornamental or aesthetic aspects of a product. Aesthetic, aesthetic is about the look and feel of a product. You've seen gumboots. There's a case in Uganda of a gentleman who went, I think, to China, ordered for a particular design of gumboots and paid for them. Bringing them to Uganda, he did not register it the first time. Someone went and, and you know, applied before him. Actually, the supplier from, I think, China who came and you know, registered it here as well. And the argument was who had it first, who had protection, and there was that whole debate. But it was just the design of the gumboot. Now the guy from China came and gave it another name and said, no, 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 for me, mine is called something else. And the issue was, are we debating trademark or are we debating industrial design? That is how important these things are. So the guy who had ordered for the manufacture of these gumboots and the design, was not arguing the name. He said, yes, the name is different, but this is not a trademark case. It is a design issue. 
And for as long as it is a design that is known in the market, you might have come and applied for registration before me, but the country or the world or the market has gotten to identify my gumboots with that particular design. So you cannot come to here and say it is not designed simply because you've created another, you know, given it another name, and he was actually successful in that case. So that's how serious these things are. The design sought to be protected must be new and original, consisting of three dimensional or two dimensional features. The idea is that we should be able to identify the whole design, not just a part of it. And I'll give you examples of those designs for you to put it uh, into perspective. In Uganda, industrial designs are protected for at least five years after which the application. Sophisticated, not as sophisticated as say patents, eh? which require a lot more in terms of the inventive step that someone has to take to create them. Those are some of the examples. Uh, Ronald, in case you can't hear me, please let me know. I know that my internet keeps being interrupted because of the calls that come. We can hear you right now. We can hear you right now. Okay, great. Thank you. So those are examples of industrial designs. When you see the Coca-Cola bottle or any other bottle of, of soda or beer or water, please understand that that one bottle carries a number of intellectual properties. Within the bottle, is a formula that was used, or what they call the Coca-Cola what? Is it called a formula, what is it called? But it's more like a trade secret. That in itself is an intellectual property, as we shall see. The design, the name Coca-Cola is a trademark, as we shall see. It's a mark or a sign that distinguishes this particular product from all others, right? Then the bottle itself is an industrial design. So you don't just create a Coca-Cola, the exact bottle, and give it another name of soda and say you are okay. You may not have infringed their trademark, but infringed their industrial design. That is how important these things are and for us to know. Look at this thing we call a scooter. I don't know what others call it, but it's an industrial design. It's a design that's specifically registered by whoever manufactured it or came up with it. And trust me, this is not even a out manufacture, it's design in the sense that the manufacturer gets guys that are creatives, the people we call creatives, eh? guys talented at creating, and says, please design for me. So here they are not manufacturing, they are designing how something is supposed to look, at, look like. And that's why, why we call it industrial designs. They're industrial because again, they can be attributed to a particular industry or line of trade and to a particular product, and they help solve a particular problem. This particular design, if you found, if you found down the person who designed it, will tell you the science behind the uniqueness of that design. Maybe the size of the tires, the size of the thing and the people it can accommodate, the fuel consumption. That design itself has a science around it, and so it can be taken for granted. Trade secrets. And now there are laws eh, to all these things. Maybe that's what I also need to mention. All these things have laws that apply to them. If you go and say trade secrets in Uganda, you'll find a law that relates to it. If you said utility models, you'd find a law that refers to it. If you say trademarks, whatever it is, it has a law. I have not burdened us with the laws because I believe most of us uh, are not lawyers or are not as interested in the law as much as we are in the commercial aspect. So that's what I've focused on. Trade secrets refer to IP rights on confidential information. Information that you believe is proprietary information that you believe is your most important information for trading and that if it went out easily, it would affect your business. I found out recently that for the tourism business, and, and for me, it's amazing how important intellectual property is. For the tourism business, the, the list of, of clients that someone has is one of their major trade secrets. That's why today, if you looked at any person, I know we all know, I think most of us would know Amos Wekesa, Great Lakes Safaris, and you feel this guy is ripping big, you know, let me just get into the industry. It is possible to set up your company, get offices, get stuff and all this stuff. And then you realize one thing, the thing that makes him stand out, apart from his passion, of course, and other things, is the list that he has built over time of certain clientele. Now, if an employee walked away from him with that list, 
chances are high he would claim infringement of his trade secret because it is core and central to his business. To qualify as a trade secret, it must be commercially viable. It's not anything that you think of in your head and you say, for me, this is a trade secret. And I've seen many people thinking they have secrets that are already public. It's just that they have not interacted with those <laughs> or even you know, managed to have interactions that have others share what they think. And you realize, by the way, what I thought was a secret is not. So it has to be commercially valuable. It has to be known only to a limited group of persons. Here you realize it doesn't say only to one individual. So if it is within work, chances are high as employees, you're coming across information that is actually a trade secret. But it does not cease to be a trade secret because it's known by more than one person. The other is reasonable steps having been taken to protect. Ah, yeah, this is critical. That is why every time you're sharing information that is confidential, it is important to say it is private and confidential. If you're signing an agreement, it is important to have a confidentiality clause. Yes, because you're taking the step to protect such that later, if there's a debate as to whether this was a secret or not, and the argument will be no, it's already in the public, or I did not know that that was a trade secret to you. To avoid that, make it very clear. It's the way we go to court and say, I am writing to you, we are handling this case, and I'm proposing a settlement, maybe give me less money than what I claimed. But because I don't want you to use it in court, the heading of my letter will be without prejudice. I don't know if you've seen it, seen that somewhere. Now, the same applies to trade secrets or confidential information. It's important that you mention it, but it's also important that you take the steps that are necessary to protect it. Now, copyright and neighboring rights. Again, in the interest of time, I'm running through so many things that you know took, took me a year to just study. And I'm continuing to learn for many years. But in the interest of time, I'm trying to run through so that we also have some time for the Q&A. Copyright and neighboring rights. Some people think of copyright to mean the right to copy. Copyright is actually the opposite. It is the right for someone to exclude others from using the creation that they have made. So it's not, it's not the right to copy. Or even if it were the right to copy, it's only to the person who is the copyright owner, who gives you the right to copy, yeah? So copyright is about literary artistic works. The idea is that these intellectual properties protect different kinds of creations. That's why I'm saying don't use the words interchangeably. It's important that you know which particular um, kind of creations would be attributed a certain name. Copyrights go to literary, artistic, musical. You've seen you know, songs, books, all these things that we create, uh, which we refer to as copyrights. On the other hand, we have what we call neighboring rights. You have produced a song, oh, oh sorry, you've, you've um, what's, who are these guys? You've composed, yes, they are composers. You've composed a song, but that song has a producer, that song has a performer, that song has a broadcaster, that song has all these people. The reason why those people are important is because if you had a song and just sang it yourself in the bathroom, like I normally do, or wherever you are, yeah, you cannot exploit it economically until all those players have come into play. Now, copyright law acknowledges that there are other players. That's why we call them neighbors learning from this. So why, why, why we call them neighboring rights are those other people that will facilitate the exploitation of a particular creation. Producers, broadcasters, performing artists, plays, but they don't act them themselves. They don't perform. It's another person who perform. So you don't say a person who has performed has infringed. What they are doing is what we call a neighboring right, and it's also protected under the law. They are what we call derivative works. You've written a book in English, and someone has translated it to another language, right? They're not necessarily infringing. They're acknowledging there's another creator who created in a particular language and we are turning it out into something else. Or you, are, you have written a play and you know people actually turn out and, and act it and record it and whatever it is. All those are works derived from the original, but they don't become infringing works simply because they're derived. We call them derivative works. How does one become eligible? How does work become or creations become eligible for copyright protection? The works have to pass the test of originality. Please note the word is originality, not novelty. For patents, it's novelty, not seen before or not anticipated that it would happen 
or can be derived from existing works. On the other hand, copyrights are original and it does not mean they should not have existed before. Yeah, they're just new. Think about songs. Yeah, you will find if you follow the music, you'll find that a lot of the lyrics, and by the not just Uganda, I think songs in general, it's very hard to find a song that has lyrics that have never happened before. But we are saying you've taken a step to develop those into something that can be called your song, if you get what I mean. So the works have to pass the test of originality and must be reduced to a material form. Now, this is also very important. Material form means there's a CD. Back then, there were cassettes. There has to be something. If it's a software, it is whatever, it's still you will need to write it or, or code, what's the word, decode, I think, into a form that can be presented in a tangible manner. So if it is a song, it is okay you sing it, but also go on to record. Because when you are applying for protection, it will be important that you illustrate the tangible manner in which you have placed this thing that you want to copyright. If it's a book, it doesn't remain in your head. You write the book, okay? Work is considered original if it is the product of the independent efforts of the author. So basically you illustrate that I've taken certain steps, which, you know, which are independent of the initial person who may have created other works that they did. This is the time spent in, in studio. This is the time I spent to research on this topic. Yes, I might have picked the content from existing li literature, but to come up with this, there's an effort that has been taken, yeah? The author is the physical person who creates the work, and this is very important. Um, that's, that's a person or the, the, the commissioner, and they will come into commissioning of works, eh? just to understand that better. But the author is the person who originally comes up with it, and has realized for copyright that economic and moral rights come into play very much. The author is recognized with moral rights. We, we, we recognize them as the authors or the originators, but the owner who takes over the economic rights might be different. I'll use the example of the George Kakoma case with the Uganda anthem. The family of the late George Kakoma who composed the Uganda anthem, I think was trying to claim that, you know, they were entitled to economic rights over this particular Uganda anthem, as we all know it. And court is saying, you, your father had the moral right. And as his estate or beneficiaries, under the law, you should be recognized. Everyone should recognize that this was originally done by George Kakoma. He has the moral rights. But because George Kakoma, if you, I don't know if you all know, but the way the Uganda anthem comes out is comes about is that government calls, the government of the day back then, calls on people to compose. So everyone composes their song and then they select. That process was a commissioning. He handed it over without charging and said, officially, this is the Uganda anthem. It becomes the property of government or the state. For that reason, there is no economic benefit. But there's a moral benefit to recognize that is George Kakoma who uh, composed that particular anthem. There are mainly two types of the rights, as I've mentioned, economic and moral. Moral are about authorship and recognition that indeed you came up with uh, this particular intellectual property item. But economic rights, on the other hand, are about you know, the right to assign license and transfer ownership. And we'll talk about that uh, more. Trademarks, on the other hand, protect signs that differentiate goods. Signs can be logos, can be marks, can be symbols, can be slogans, can be smell. And, and I know you're going to ask me how do you protect a smell? I don't know. But in our law, it is stated as one of the ways that something can be distinguished from another. By the way, you'll be surprised, or okay, not surprised, you will know that Fanta or Coke, they're all sodas, but it smells differently. Now, that smell is not by accident, or it's not something you can just get and duplicate and say, let me do this. The idea is to distinguish and create fair competition. For people not to just copy things and move on and go on with it uh, without any hindrance, the law tries to restrict what you can do so that we protect those that create. A uh, bison that you see in the right corner is a trademark that is registered. We've seen some people going on to, you know, try to use it. I've heard of some awards or whatever it is. And they're infringing the mark because it is registered. They may not be aware, but, but uh, ignorance of the law is not a defense. So we will take them on, <laughs> you know, as, you know, say, you know, because we feel they have infringed. Trademark protection is, is uh, you know, valid for seven years, but can be renewed.
The trademarks, you know, have a process as well for registration. I'll just highlight one step that is important, gazetting of the trademark. Maybe even before that, when you apply for whatever you call intellectual property, in this case, trademarks, the registry will examine if that trademark is actually yours, if it's original, if, it has, if it's not really being used. But they take the extra step to advertise what we call the Uganda Gazette. I don't know how many of us have looked at the Uganda Gazette or even know what it means. But it's a government uh, weekly, you would call it what? Newspaper, it's not a newspaper really. It's where you know, all these official communications under the law are published. So this publication is for 60 days. The idea is to say, as the registry, we do not see a mark similar to what has been applied for by this particular individual, but we want the public to confirm if you know that's the case. We may not know, but someone out there is already using it. Uh, once that process is done, you'll be granted a certificate. And without that certificate, you cannot claim trademark protection. This is very important. Copyrights need not be registered for someone to have copyright protection. We only advise that you register them simply to make sure that in case, for example, there's a case or an argument about who owns it, you have better evidence because you have a certificate of registration. For trademarks, on the other hand, you cannot talk about trademark infringement or someone infringing your trademark unless it is registered. And I know many businesses that have their marks, we even know their marks, and they think they have trademarks. They don't. They could claim that someone is passing off as them and succeed, which is another claim altogether in, in law, but they cannot claim trademark infringement. The fees are there, and I will not get into them much. Uh, the steps and the fees, you will follow that in the presentation in the interest of time. A question about domain names. Eh? You've seen it happen, signum, uh, www.signum.com, whatever, you know, .com. What you need to know is that domain names by themselves are not intellectual properties. They only gain their protection through trademark. Okay? They are banded together as a trademark. What it means is that whatever you want to have domain name protection for must first qualify as trademark protectable, or it must be a trademark trademarked kind of uh, sign, which if you then put in a, in a domain name can be protected. The example there is Facebook. It has to be a trademark first, and then facebook.com will be protected. Protecting software, again, there's a huge debate for those that are in the tech world. You understand this better than me in terms of open source kind of software, there's cases that we've seen between Google and Oracle and all these other people. The debate in, in software really is what is protected. And again, we illustrate in this presentation that there are different levels. Eh? It can be protected as copyright, patent, whatever, you know? But each option covers a different portion of the rights in the software, okay? So it's important to decide what to do uh, in protecting your software. What exactly are you protecting the software? What is source? Have you put it in an open source where everyone has a right to you know, use it? And then you still want to protect it. I think there's a huge debate there when it comes to software specifically. Yeah. If you choose the trademark option, it will only protect the name of the software or the symbol that distinguishes that software from all else. The question of profiting, allow me to move fast. I know my time is, is fast spent. You can benefit from intellectual property in three ways. One, by using it yourself. So I've registered the bison. Some call it a cow, others call it a bull, others call it whatever you want to eat, but it's a bison. That bison is progressing aggressively. That's what we are about as a farm. Right? So we use it to distinguish our services from all others. We are challengers of status quo. We believe in approaching legal services differently. We believe in content sharing. We believe in legal education for everyone. There are certain things we believe in, and that's why you see us on these platforms, not just myself, but even all others that I work with. That's what we stand for. Now, how we use that is what ben the benefit we get from that is by using it to distinguish our services from all else. That when someone thinks of Signum, they'll think of this mark, or if they think of the mark, they'll think of us, which helps to distinguish our services and helps us to profit. But there are other ways. We can license someone else or authorize someone to work within certain limits to use our trademark at a fee. And I'll explain more about that in uh, franchising. 
The other way is to assign it. When you assign it, you've totally uh, dissolved yourself of the rights that accrue to it, or you would say, I have sold it. So those are the three ways. Using it as it is yourself, as a creator or owner. Licensing it is to allow someone else to use it or the right to use within certain limits. And then assigning it is to totally sell it off. You have all those rights as an intellectual property owner. The distinction, as I've mentioned there, between licensing and uh, assigning is that while assigning transfers rights, licensing gives part of the rights. The licensor retains, when it comes to lic the licensing, the licensor retains ownership of the uh, IP, while the assigner gives up the rights. Now, licensing uh, to a franchisee or in franchise transactions. I know, Ronald, uh, this particular presentation came out of the last discussion we had or that Enterprise Uganda hosted on franchising. So I thought that it would be important to relate it. Franchising allows someone to set up and run their own business under your name. And here we are talking about name, uh, both in terms of company name, but for intellectual property, we are talking about your trademark. So I'll give an example. For Uganda, you have KFC as a brand, right? The company in the US, I don't think it's called KFC. In Uganda, it is called, the company that has the franchise is called Kuku Foods. For those that may be aware or may not, it's Kuku Foods. But Kuku Foods has the franchise of KFC, and you will not see Kuku Foods on their restaurants. You'll see KFC. So that's why intellectual property then is important. It may not necessarily be the company name, but just the brand name when you're doing a franchise. More commonly in the franchise relationships, we see more of licensing, licensing than transferring or than, than uh, assigning. And the reason is simple. In franchising, the franchiser does not envisage totally selling off. They are looking at continuing to earn franchise fees. They are looking at carrying on their business or their brand being used across, you know, across a country or across the world. So for that reason, they are not assigning, they're only licensing. There are limitations to licensing, even in franchising. And that's why you need to have legal advice. There are time limits, there are fewer rights, not everything that a franchiser has a right to do, they will necessarily allow the franchisee to also do. There's exclusive and non-exclusive licensing. I won't take a lot of time on that because as you it, exclusive is to say, uh, you know, the only one allowed to use this license. Non-exclusive is to say there'll be others. And this can operate in such a way that if I wanted to trade in Kenya using the name Signum and to allow franchises to use it, non-exclusive would mean that I can authorize more than one firm to use. Exclusive means one firm takes over the rights fully within a particular jurisdiction uh, to use that particular uh, trademark or whatever intellectual property it is. There's what we call commissioning of intellectual property. And this is very important. If any of you followed the COVIDX situation, you have a professor who comes up with a medical solution or, or, you know, or invention or medicine, but the university where they work is this individual was conducting research within the university, he's a professor, we pay him money, so we own it. So the debate is around commissioning and ownership of intellectual property within a, you know, an employer-employee relationship. That's why I thought it is important to highlight. Commissioning refers to instructing someone to perform a particular task of their skill for you. You remember George Kakoma, the example I gave about the national anthem. So you commission and say, please go out, do research, do this kind of thing. The commissioning party under IP laws is the first owner of that work. It is not the author, it is the commissioner. So if it's a university that has commissioned you to conduct research, they've paid you, they've said, go and do this, they're the owners, yeah? Two requirements for commission to be valid. One, there must be an obligation to pay, meaning you don't tell someone I have commissioned you. Okay, and it does, not, it does not matter how much you're paying, even if you're paying 100 shillings, but it must be clear that there's a payment that is attributed to it. I think the reason or the rationale for that is to, to avoid a situation where someone says, I did not benefit from what I created. You're making it very clear that I'm going to take ownership of what you're going to come up with, and this is the fee, and you sign a contract and agree. Yeah, the commissioning must happen before the work is created. You cannot get Professor Guang 
get him to create his work or his COVIDX. Sorry, I'm using him as an example. It's the most live example that I'm, I'm sure we all can identify with. You don't do that. And after he has come up with it, COVID has come and you prove his thing can solve. And then you say, by the way, you were commissioned. It's not an afterthought. It has to be made very clear in one's contract. And let's move to employment to say, this is what we've assigned you to do. This is the fee for it. Please go on and do it. At the workplace, people employed are presumed to act for the benefit of their employer. So there's a commissioning rule that presupposes that whatever you do in employment is on behalf of your employer. However, however, when there's a dispute, chances are high we will get into what the employment contract says. It is for that reason that there must be clauses about intellectual property in employment contracts. I hope we are all noting this. If you're an employer, it is important that you're clear on what you know, who owns the intellectual property in what your employees come up with. Otherwise, it's not, it may not be very useful for you if we find later and there's a day that indeed there was no restriction. I've had a recent dispute about a project manager in a company that I advise where this gentleman says, I got another job, but it doesn't affect my work. And the employer says, but it is obvious that if you're working with us eight to five, you cannot work elsewhere. And I'm telling the employer, look, you're wrong. If there's no specific restriction under the law, under the contract, or under the human resource policies, operational policies of the organization that restrict someone from working elsewhere, then you're going to have to prove if indeed their work affects their delivery of work at your workplace. And you cannot determine that on the first day of them getting their job. But if you are very specific in saying, look, you cannot sign a contract. You cannot form, have any form of employment elsewhere. It's not about how much time they are giving to you. It's about the fact that you strictly prohibited it so that it becomes a breach in case they did it. Lastly, as I close, registering IP in the African region, it's just important for you to know that there's an organization called ARIPO, Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization, and there's another called WIPO or WIPO as World Intellectual Property Organization. Those organizations are formed subject to treaties by nations that subscribe to what those organizations stand for. In essence, every time you're thinking of protecting your brand regionally or locally through these offices, there's a procedure and you will see it in the two, last two slides of this presentation. But what is important is that that protection, even if you succeeded, can only apply to the countries that subscribe to a particular treaty that has set in place or establishes that organization. In essence, you cannot have protection worldwide because not everyone subscribes to the particular organizations which I've mentioned to you. And if they don't, then your protection cannot apply to their countries. What then you would have to do is to appoint agents, and in this case, it can be law offices or law firms or whatever it is, who can then help you register per jurisdiction. What I normally advise clients to do is to, is to one, if you approach us as Signum, for example, we have firms that we collaborate with across the nations or across the world. And we're able to say in Kenya, we work with this firm, instruct us, and we'll collaborate with them to make sure this happens. The idea is very simple, that because these intellectual properties are jurisdictional, every country would, have, would like to protect the innovations or inventions within its country and its own, you know, uh, its own creators or creatives, as we call them. So for that reason, they will not give general protection unless you specifically apply to their country. So I would advise that you start with the nations or countries where you feel you're going to first operate, start with those because it's also an expensive process. So if you say, I want to start with Kenya, go to Kenya first. You don't have to register across the world for something that you're not going to sell across the world the first time. Uh, Ronald, you will allow me to end right there, but please, I'm ending the sharing of my screen and requesting that you bring back that gentleman uh, <laughs> so we can, we can get to see. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ronald. If you can just kindly allow, I don't know, allow people to unmute or maybe the person that I'll ask to unmute and they just try to tell us what they think is wrong or may not be accurate about this statement here. I hope we all can see the statement. I'll just ask randomly or is there someone who would want to volunteer? Preferably not a lawyer. Anything that you find not accurate according to what we've learned this morning about this statement. 
Does anyone want to give it a shot? Uh, sorry, if there's no one, then that's, I'm just going to... Certainly that. not Mumbere. Hmm? Not Mumbere. <laughs> but but uh, Ronald, how do you know Mumbere? <laughs> Mumbere, we have noticed, uh, knows a bit more about these things from uh, from what we see in the chat room. Hey, so if the same <laughs> to answer, we will know. <laughs> uh, okay. But I think, what I, think, I, think, I think the person who I really wanted to answer this is... Uh, is uh is um let me see just one minute i think there, there, there are a couple of people who have asked a number of questions in the chat so i wanted to see whether they have uh they have got a bit of comfort on uh on on, on the subject uh, mm. i don't know whether henry are you still on on the call Henry, Henry was one of them, and uh, Kaduya. Possibly, I'll ask one of them to. If Ronald, uh, no, Ronald, yes, there are a couple I, of ones. I think Peter, yeah, yeah. Peter mm. and Mariam. Peter, you can go first. Peter and Maria. Peter, you can unmute. Let me ask. You can unmute. Yes. Hello. Good morning to everyone. I don't know whether I can be heard. Good morning. We Good morning. You, Peter. We can hear you. Mm. Yes, Peter Biarohanga, and I'm the team lead at uh, Bakere Innovation and Integration Center. I think what's wrong with the, with the advert, patenting involves disclosing. You can't patent without disclosing. That's what I think. Uh, Peter, that is accurate. That is accurate. We said in the process of registration it's important to describe it's important to as describe as much as you can whatever you want protection for but why because there's going to be a substantive test going deep into what you're saying you're creating and is new or you know novel that cannot happen if you're not disclosing anything so so peter you're 100 right maria wants to give it a shot if you can allow her the rights to unmute uh, I don't know if she sees. There are many issues, by the way, with this statement. So I'll allow about three to four people to just try and then we get into the QA. If you can just allow Maria to unmute. Maria, Maria, Bure is here. Let me let me let me ask Bure to speak, then I get to Maria. Bure, you can speak as I look for Maria. Uh, hello. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Morning, yes, we hear you very well. Okay. Yes, now for me, uh, uh, my my concern is about uh, uh, this guy's fear. De De Mr. David Senfoka, uh, this guy's fear. And maybe his fear could be that uh, given our environment in Uganda, where maybe uh, people go on uh, doing things and uh, uh, protectionism or protection is even difficult, is that when he discloses, eh, then someone or people or even the organization, maybe National Drug Authority can go behind him and he will not benefit from it. That's why he's insisting of patenting it even before. Yet, yet he has to disclose and they go ahead and, and uh, they go ahead and even um, um, uh, get to know that yes, this formula or even this result will not affect people in the long run. Because now this is this is a, this is like a, a technological thing, and it, it deals with human beings. What of if after ten years there are effects, there are, there are side effects that we can we as a country we cannot solve with his formula? So me, I think he's between a, a, a hard place and a rock. That's what Moses, I can say. Moses, thank you very much for addressing his fear. But before you go off, eh, please please stay on. Just one question. If his fears are addressed, can his formula be protected from what you have learned today? Moses, please unmute. I'm trying to unmute Moses. <laughs> Kindly unmute Moses. I need his answer on that, and then we have one last yeah. person and do the Q and A. Uh -huh. Now, uh, um, what what I'm saying, Moses? You know, hello, Moses. 
Hello. Moses. Moses speaking. You hear me? Yes. What I am saying is we acknowledge what you've said. I just need a yes or no. If he's assured of, you know, uh, the fears you're concerned about, if they are covered, yes. okay? Mm. Is his cancer formula, diabetes and cancer formula, patentable according to what we have learned? It's a yes or no. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the... Yes. It, you think it's a yes. Okay. That's yes. okay, Moses. Yeah. That's okay, Moses. Uh, Maria? We have Maria. Maria, you can go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Peter hinted on what I wanted. What Alex uh, presented, uh, looking at uh, his formula is not necessarily, is not necessarily something he has created uh, and a new, because if I remember correctly, Alex, you mentioned that uh, a patent is for something that is uh, very, very new that hasn't yet been done before. Is that correct? I yes. hope my memory serves me right. And uh, looking at the cancer and diabetes being uh, existing conditions for years, he's, he's not necessarily, I don't think he's necessarily working with fresh information because uh, most of the concerns have been around and probably he's improving on what is already existing. And then, um, the copyright aspect which was said to be uh to apply to literally works and uh, uh artistic works that is also where i also found uh, an issue thank you maria you you're 100 percent right on the last statement about copyright ladies and gentlemen this gentleman says as the headline I will only disclose, disclose my diabetes and cancer formula after patenting it. And then he goes on to say, I am ready to declare my formula to the NDA. However, it can only happen if the product is patented to be protected from copyright piracy. Ladies and gentlemen, copyright cannot protect scientific inventions. Okay. So I think that was the other thing I wanted to highlight and uh, Maria has brought it out very well. But Maria, regarding the inventive step, the issue is not the fact that the problem being treated or problem for which we are finding a solution has not existed before. So it's not, the issue is not the disease, diabetes or cancer having been there or having other solutions. The issue is the uniqueness of the solution that you're creating. So based on that, you wouldn't say he can be denied, denied protection. The reason why he would be denied protection, though, is what I talked about as items not regarded as protectable under patent law in Uganda. And one of them was pharmaceutical products, including Covidex. Because of the treaties we sub we've signed and the principles. I hope I hope that's uh, that's clear enough, Ronald. In the interest of time, could we maybe take a few questions? I don't know how much time we're left with. I think we are. We are I'm, I'm going to request uh, our colleagues to allow us just uh, five minutes uh, so that we can uh, take a round of questions. There are a couple of questions which were in the chat room. Uh, I think we can possibly concentrate on those. We usually like to end at ten thirty, but I'm going to request that uh, colleagues allow us five to 10 minutes to just wrap up a couple of questions and then we can be able to, to wrap it up. Uh, I, I think I'm going to, uh, Alex, I'll just read a couple of questions in the chat room. Some, uh, uh, Abraham has ably answered some of them. You can look at some of them and see if you can add to what Abraham has said, which was very kind that you came along with, uh, with Abraham. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the question here from Rosemary who says, how do you advise universities that invest heavily in research and innovation to protect their IPs? And then uh, if I register a business name with URSB, when does the registration expire? I think that's a separate question altogether from James. 
uh, but I think you can quickly touch on those and possibly uh, possibly a couple of the ones Abraham touched on, whether you want to add anything to them. If there is a hand, I'll give a chance to one. Uh, Moses, do you have another question which you wanted to ask or your hand is just left up? All right, I think Alex will take a couple of those and then we, we see if we have just room for one more round. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ronald. Quickly, how can universities, uh, Rosemary asked a question, how can universities ensure that, you know, for that research that they commission? I think that's a very important question because the goal also of IP is not, is to avoid, you know, double benefit, unfair benefit. For me, unfair benefit would just say you've been commissioned, paid and officially told, you know, you're on an assignment and you're paid for it. By the way, the money paid for it, such as huge monies. And then you turn around to say, this is my work. I think it's important to just be clear that you have contracts that specifically spell out what this person has been assigned to do and what their responsibilities are and the fact that they are paid for it. I know that universities work with schools and, you know, what do they call them? Uh, we call them schools, we call them faculties. And some of them have a semblance of independence. And I think that brings serious issues. Uh, Makere has a lot of that, that they get their own funding and all this stuff. Now, when they get their funding and their researchers, chances are high that the funders of that research are the ones commissioning, not even the university, depending on how the university is structured. Yeah. So the key thing is to know who is commissioning and can they have specific contracts with the people they are commissioning. About business names, business names are not intellectual property. And again, this is a challenge that we have had in the sense that our registry, Uganda Registration, Registration Services Bureau, registers companies, registers businesses, registers intellectual properties or trademarks, and people tend to confuse that. Even the system that searches might tell you this trademark is not available because it's being used by another person as a business name. In our view as lawyers, most of us believe that that is wrong. Or if it is to avoid confusion, then there should be a reconciliation of how things work. But please understand that by registering a business name, you've not registered a trademark. The two are different. If someone went and specifically applied, they could easily get a trademark of a name that you've already been using as a business name. So there's no limit to business name. There's no expiry to your business name. There's an expiry if it is a trademark, as we've seen, and you can renew. But the key thing is to distinguish that too. That's what I can say. All right. Uh, yeah. th thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know whether there are any questions. Uh, we're just at the 10.30 uh, mark. Uh, if there are any other questions, I will give. Yes, there is Lillian. Lillian, you can uh, you can unmute and ask your question. I'll take one or two people and then we'll wrap up. Lillian, thanks, over Alex. To thanks, Alex, for for the very um, informative session. Just on your last point that you said that um, that uh, what um, business name can you can have both a business name and then someone can also uh, register it. Um, so does it mean that if it's already your business name and then someone, what did you say, copyrights? Those names are confusing. Can you now therefore not have rights to use a business name? Who, who has more legal, yeah, <laughs> authority over that, either the business name or the other one? Uh, okay. All right. uh, Joan, uh, possibly Alex, let's get Joan also, and then you answer them once. Joan, over to you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask Moses. He mentioned something very important at, uh, you know, in his last statement, that uh, the legal fraternity isn't comfortable with the intellectual property registration being part of URSB. And my concern is, since there is so much uh, business, th there are so many uh, business, uh, small businesses, big uh, businesses, you know, there's so much of, the, of that kind of establishment in the economic structure of this country. How can we get the two to be separated so that the, the registration of businesses can be separated from intellectual property registration? Because I've had a number of uh, people complaining 
about the level of integrity in that institution. So if we can get a voice that can push for the two to be separated, I think uh, more businesses would be comforted. That's my suggestion and query to what is being done about separating the two. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, uh, Alex, do you want to make comments to that? Um, yes, I, I will beg to be reminded of the first question. I forget very fast. Uh, I, so, think, I think the, the question which Lillian was asking is that there is you, uh, your, your last statement when you talked about the difference between registering your business name and then registering uh, registering the, 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 the IP of the, uh, the so you show us she was kind of asking who retains the rights, assuming someone registers uh, what would have been your your business name or and then kind of uh, uses it as uh, uh, he kind of takes the IP right on it. So that, that was, I think, the spirit of her question. Yeah, and I think the two questions are related, really, uh, in the sense that because of our uncoordinated movement, troop movements, and again, you can't blame it entirely on the Registration Services Bureau. It's also on us as business people to understand the difference between the two, yeah? Because the business name is a name. It's not as restricted as trademarks are. But also, as you realize, the moment you enter the trademark protection angle, you're monopolizing certain things. So you could like credo management and there's credo saloons there's credo whatever those are business names and they can be used by everyone the idea is not to try to monopolize things that would otherwise have been used by others but when you look at trademarks the idea is there's an effort beyond just stating a word so credo as a company has a business name or company name called credo management but it also has a mark signum has a map and has the word signum with it. So we've registered the bison itself and the color and the shape in which it appears. It's not just saying the bison is our trademark. So anyone who uses it, people can use it in other forms. It's just an animal. But trademark protection or intellectual property protection is to go the extra mile to say, there's a step taken, an effort taken to create or make something appear in a way that distinguishes it from others. So yes, you can use a bison, but not in the specific way, with our colors, with the shape in which it is, with the motion that it has, and all that stuff. That's what intellectual property pro uh, protects. Business names, on the other hand, can be names that everyone else has. But the thing is, business name registration will be then to say, can the name be attributed to an individual? Now, how do we then, which one takes priority? The two protections are totally different. And by all means, the, the standard that will be placed on them if there's a challenge in terms of a debate will be totally different. What is happening currently, I believe, and what we are pushing for, why I'm say, are saying we have a problem as lawyers, is to try to make sure that by the time you apply for a business name or trademark, there's a, there's, there are people who argue that you should compare even with existing business names, even if the application is for a trademark, to avoid conflict, yeah? But remember, people are using some of these things even without registration. So that's why you have a problem. So it's going to take a lot of education. I agree with Joan that uh, the Bureau needs to be more streamlined. When you talk about the Bureau, you talk about every other institution in the country. Can you trust the integrity of the people? And for me, I am the kind who does not believe in thinking change is going to come from anywhere else, but to believe that change starts with me. Am I a copycat? Am I the kind that respects other people's inventions and innovations? So let's, let's, let's just try to push for change, but also be the change that we want to see. And I believe the first way for us to do that is to equip ourselves with knowledge, to know these things, to consult where we do not know. And that's why some of us you know, are here to see that we can support and help you to do better at what you do. Um, Ronald, if you can just allow me to share my screen, I would share my last slide, which is my contacts. I'm sure that's a question uh, many yeah. people would want to put up. Please so, do, please do. Yeah, I can just share so that. Yeah, if that is a question, it is answered by me having shared. I'm sure we all can see the screen. Uh, that's my email address, phone number. Abraham is a colleague of mine at work. Uh, thank you, Abraham, for being on the call. We are.
at this presentation together. So I agree with whatever Abraham has, has, has used as answers. That's why I've not repeated these things. And I think it has also, also helped us to save time as some of the questions were being in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, and, and that's Alex's contact. As he has rightly said, one of the things we believe at Enterprise Uganda is that any business, you need to engage professionals to get things done. And there are, there, there are answers which we won't, won't be able to cover on a call like this, but uh, Alex has been kind enough to share his contact. Uh, I hope also Abraham can, can do the same so that we can be, you can be able to engage them beyond this meeting uh, on this journey. I think I want to go back to the statement which Alex started with uh, comparing uh, intellectual property to a land title, comparing intellectual property to an asset that you own, a property that you own. I think that is such a powerful statement. It is important to note that the wealth of the day has totally shifted. Uh, of the 10 richest men, uh, I, th I think, and I think they are men, uh, but, but, but by like that, the, the top 10, six of them have actually made their money in spaces like this, uh, in technology and making sure that they are creating new things, creating Amazon, creating Facebook. Uh, those are things which have changed in our day. And I think as, as a nation, as a business community, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are also working in that direction. And I hope that this meeting has succeeded in kind of demystifying this topic and enabling us to say that it's actually possible. Uh, people like Alex and many in the space uh, of intellectual property are right there to make sure that they help you on this journey. What is important for you as an entrepreneur, as we usually say, is that you need to make that step. You need to make that step. You need to make that investment to make sure that you are getting ahead of the pack. Uh, you don't want to see someone benefit from your idea simply because you did not walk through, uh, you did not secure your intellectual property on the same. So we are, it's quite a journey, Alex. I've learned a number of things. I'm very interested in this thing called the utility model. Uh, I, I didn't know neighborhood neighboring rights. Those are very fascinating things and I think they have widened uh, personally my understanding of this topic, but more importantly for the many of us who have been here. Once again, a big thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Uh, we will continue with the, with the recovery series next week. We are always excited when you join us. We hope you learn something new. Please leave a comment for Alex. Uh, leave a thank you for Alex in the chat room. And tell us what you, who, who you are, the lesson you have picked, the business which you do, so that we can uh, continue engaging. We'll keep the meeting open for the next five to 10 minutes for any chats which need to go out there. But a big thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, I, I'm very, very excited that you all here. So thanks a lot, Alex. A big thank you from us. It is such an honor for you to have spent time to come and educate us. We feel like we have indeed learned something new. I think one thing Alex said, which is important, is that the 21st century professional has to continuously be improved. And for us, this is, we feel that we have continuously, or we have improved certainly as we have walked this journey. So a big, big thank you for being here. Uh, James uh, Babumba, please do share your contact. I'm very interested in uh, having a, a chat specifically on, uh, on, on drying fruits. There is a client who has been looking for someone in that space. So, uh, but thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you for being here and all the best within the week. Enjoy the rest of the week. Please remember that we will share the link to this meeting. It's usually on our YouTube channel if someone missed out, so that will be available.